Okay. We are very happy to have Matthew today from Queensmary to tell us about some applications of three super symmetric fields. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, uh, thank, thanks for the hospitality and for the opportunity to discuss this. Um, yeah, apologies for changing the topics at the last minute. Um, yeah, as I told you, fun. I think I'll see him in a month, and maybe I'll talk about that in Brussels. So I, I want to. So hopefully, it won't be boring for you in a month. I I've switched topics uh, to something else. Um, <laughs> And uh, right, so so I'm going to discuss um, some applications of free supersymmetric fields. So this is with a bunch of people uh, from from Queen Mary. Um, so Ananya Banerjee, who is a postdoc at Queen Mary, but is now I think going to join Philip Barjuris's group in Cincinnati in the fall. Jumai Bargava, who's a PhD student, and Hong Yang Zhang, who's a former postdoc now now at Imperial. Um, postdoc at Imperial, but um, good. So these are the people. Um, so so right. So. Uh, since, since, since free supersymmetric fields are kind of a, a, a sort of very pedestrian sounding um, and kind of boring sounding uh, topic, uh, I hope you'll let me begin with something slightly more, uh, something slightly more uh, elaborate and maybe more interesting, sort of to explain why, why, why I care about uh, free supersymmetric fields. Um, and the, the main reason will be to try to say something um, non-trivial about the space of quantum field theories, but really, I think what we'll succeed in doing is maybe saying something non-trivial about the representation theory of local operators um, in, in, in certain kinds of quantum field theories. Um, so, so, so to get there, to explain what I mean, um, uh, let me just, you know, I have this sort of simple diagram of the space of quantum field theories, which is some kind of exotic geometrical space uh, where different points correspond uh, to different quantum field theories, um, and basically all the theories that we've studied um, of whatever type live on the space, um, and all theories that we'll ever study uh, also live on the space. And there are, of course, all sorts of interesting and weird relations between different points, dualities, RG flows, all this other stuff. Um, and of course, like understanding anything concrete about um, this space is very difficult. Um, so we have a, an idea of what this space looks like locally, um, but even here it's complicated, right? Because you have infinitely many uh, locally irrelevant uh, directions. Um, and global questions like, you know, what is the topology of, of, of this space seem uh, even further out of reach? Right? Um, uh, so to make sense of such questions, sometimes we try to specialize to uh, special spaces of theories. Um, and you know, one sort of very nice paper from the 1980s or 1990s uh, was by Bafa, where he looked at sort of the space of Birozoro minimal models, um, because of course we understand the Birozoro minimal models completely, uh, and you can try to understand what that space might be. So there might be some hope to, 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 to do that. Um, but at least by the tools that were available in the 1980s, and actually I won't have anything further to say about the Bears or models, but at least by the tools that were available in the 1980s, um, this didn't quite work out. Um, so in particular, Bafa used the C theorem was sort of new at that point. So he used the C theorem and Morse theory, sort of treating the C function as a Morse function. Um, and he used some ideas from topology to try to constrain this space, but he only ended up with some sort of infinite set of spaces that could correspond to this space of theory. So it could have been, he, would, he included it could be CT infinity and the loop space of SU2 or a bunch of other a bunch of other spaces. So even in this very simple case where we understand these theories completely, um, understanding what this, uh, what, 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 this, what this subspace of theories looks like uh, is very, very complicated. Matt, just yeah. a quick question. So I actually just came across this paper yeah. recently. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice paper. So yeah. I want to understand, like, uh, since it's like a paper from almost 40 years ago, yeah. is there some better understanding, even in this very simple model? Well, what, one thing I was hoping would, in my visit here was to ask you, maybe okay. using defects or something, it should be possible. Okay, to say okay, something one after. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything like very deep to say at, at, at the moment about this, but yeah. Uh, right. So, so this is just to say that the problem is hard. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, but there are some reasons for optimism. Uh, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, um, but one thing you can do is, is try to use supersymmetry, right, to, to get some non-trivial non control over, over the deformations that are required to sort of map out these spaces. Um, so one sort of paradox, one example that, that uh, I will keep in mind uh, throughout this talk um, is just a very simple example uh, in three dimensions where you have some chiral superfield, free chiral superfield, um, and you know it starts off its life as something with scaling dimension a half, and then you can imagine coupling it to itself through some term of the superpotential, which I've written in equation one, and you can study the corresponding RG flow. Um, and the corresponding RG flow is to some kind of supersymmetric version of the Ising model. Um, and what it does is it takes us from some um, chiral multiplet in the UV with free scaling dimensions to some chiral multiplet in the IR with scaling dimensions that are a bit funny, right? So it just sort of renormalizes. It just sort of renormalizes the scaling dimension of the of the of the operator in the IR. Um, so 
in, in the language of super conformal representations, I mean, maybe this looks a bit pointless now, but I'll sort of use some of this language a little bit later. Um, what it means is that we take some free chiral multiplet, that's what this gobbledygook means here, with dimension one half and, U, and R charge one half, and the RG flow essentially spits. So this generates the operator algebra in the UV, right? Because the operator algebra can be built just out of um, products of free fields. And th it takes this generator of the operator algebra in the UV and maps it to something in the IR that um, has different scaling dimension and that maybe obeys some slightly different uh, operator relations. Um, but the point is that, you know, supersymmetry is quite useful here because it tells you how the generator sort of uh, changes under the RG flow. And you can see that the change in quantum numbers in equation two is basically of order the original quantum number. So you started with something with dimension a half, you end up with something dimension two thirds. So the change in the dimensions is roughly, roughly comparable to the starting um, quantum numbers. So, so, but supersymmetry sort of does tell you something, so, so something very non-trivial uh, in this case. And there are other sort of much more um, uh, general theories where supersymmetry also tells you a lot. So here you might object that uh, this, this RG flow doesn't look very interesting because sort of the coordinates in the UV, like the theory space coordinates, sort of phi in the UV and phi in the IR, they look very similar. But of course, supersymmetry also allows you to discuss theories where the UV and IR degrees of freedom look very different. So one canonical example is cyber duality, where you have some SUNC super QCD with NF flavors in the UV, and then it flows to some, in general, depending on the number of flavors, it flows, it can flow to some theory with a completely different gauge group and a completely different matter content. And again, with supersymmetry, you can sort of compute some observables um, and you can sort of match UV and IR uh, descriptions. So, um, and an even more relevant example to us is the, the cyber witten solution for SU2N equals two super young mills, because pretty soon I'm going to restrict to theories with eight Poincare supercharges. Um, and this is sort of a cartoon sketch of what Cyber and Whitten did. They started with some gauge theory in the UV, uh, and they sort of figured out the infrared phase of this theory completely, basically the two derivative prepotential in technical terms, and they sort of mapped it in terms of this nice diagram involving monopoles and dions uh, of the infrared. So basically they, they took some, some, some theory uh, that was weakly coupled in the UV, and they completely solved at least the two derivatives, uh, the, the, the theory in the, in the infrared. So all these examples um, involve crucial uses of free um, chiral fields. Mm -hmm. So these are some kinds of nice fields. They're free, like in cyber Witten, they're free in the infrared, actually, and also in the UV, at least in this particular case, and similarly in these other descriptions. So you have free fields in the UV, free fields in the IR that are in general match, mapped in very uh, different ways. In this ex first example, you have free fields in the UV mapped to something interacting in the IR. But again, supersymmetry sort of tells you a, a lot about what's going on here. Now, um, since symmetries are kind of topological in nature, we expect them to have something to say about uh, the topology of the space of quantum field theories, like to tell us which theories are connected to which other theories under the preservation of certain symmetries. Um, and uh, the, this sort of the fact that free fields in these supersymmetric cases are sort of ubiquitous, and as far as I know, basically all, almost all renormalization group flows on supersymmetry in some limit have at least some set of free fields. This motivates us to ask a certain question. Like, are, are free quantum field theories connected to all other quantum field theories in the space of quantum field theories via continuous deformation? So of course, this is a question that's very hard to answer. It's been asked by many other people, um, but what we're gonna try to do today is sort of get a little sub piece of this problem and try to solve it. Okay. So, so, um, uh, so, so um, to, to further specialize, uh, what I wanna do is I want to sort of um, discuss local theories and we're gonna see you may wonder why, why we're um, specializing to local theories, but we'll see soon that, um, uh, well, free fields on their own, at least regular free fields, not generalized free fields, but free fields themselves are, of course, local. Um, and so it's quite natural to try to connect, um, if you're going to try to connect free theories with, with other quantum field theories, it's quite natural to try to connect them with local quantum field theories. And we're going to see that this is actually very important uh, in, in a few slides. Um, so, of course, this is still a very hard question. Of course, I have no no way to, to, to prove that, that you can connect uh, free theories with, with any local uh, quantum field theory. But to make things more concrete and to make things sort of solvable by a human, um, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the representations of the symmetries and ask a closely related question. Okay? So this is essentially the question that we're going to try to, to, to answer this talk. Um, and the question is the following. The question is, when is it possible um, to construct arbitrary unitary multiplets of the superconformal algebra, let's say with eight Poincare supercharges, 
that are compatible with locality. So this will be very important that these representations are compatible with locality. Not all representations are compatible with locality. So the question is going to be, when, when is it possible to construct arbitrary unitary multiples of the superconformal algebra with eight Poincare supercharges that are compatible with locality from continuous deformations of representations in free theories? So you can have kind of in mind, if you want, this particular uh, example where, you know, we started, so we started with some free theory, which had a free chiral multiple of, with some free scaling dimension, one half, and it's connected by RG flow to something with some interacting dimension. Um, and so uh, the question is essentially, when, like, to, to what extent is this more generally true? Okay. So, so, so this is the basic question. Uh, it's important also that the combination of that, right? Say again. That is also important that there is some kind of a combination of the additional multiple. Re recombination. Yes. In, in this example here, yes. or more generally, yeah. In this, yeah. So in this example, there is recombination because there's a null state effectively. Yeah. I mean, yeah here yeah. there's a null state because basically at order three, the the the. the so so you're gonna allow for the. Uh, the uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so here already you see that like there's some there's some recombination happening. Yeah. Other questions. Yeah. Please uh, obviously feel free to interrupt. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to mainly discuss the most interesting case of four dimensions, but um, we also studied uh, this question in two, three, and five dimensions. We didn't study it explicitly in six, but the story, I think, is very similar to five. Um, so we'll see that two, three, and five, this question can be completely solved. In four dimensions, it can't be completely solved, which is part of what makes four dimensions interesting, but instead leads to some interesting conjectures that sort of generalize uh, a lot of results in the literature. So generalize some results, for example, with all the set and void of, um, and some, some, some other so, so, so some other results as well. Okay, so 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 let me let me so so what I want to do uh, is I want to impose um, two two nice things: unitarity and locality. Um, so so usually if, for people who studied um, the superconformal algebra, um, usually you spit out a list of unitary representations. So this has been done by Dolan and Osborne, um, Cordova, Dimitrescu, and Intrilligator, and various other people, Manuala. Um, so so typically the way this exercise works. Um, is that you, you don't really care about locality, basically. So, so the only thing that you care about are the, the charges of the superconformal algebra. So in the modern language, I don't know, I think it's correct to say, what you really care about are sort of the action of some topological defects, basically, on the local operators. You don't really care about the existence of currents. Okay? So for example, you can take the energy momentum tensor, t mu nu, you can take the zero component, t zero mu, you can integrate it over some space like hypersurface, and you get p mu, this, this topological surface. And one sort of very famous um, constraint um, that follows from acting with this topological surface on local operators, basically acting with p squared on some bosonic state, is that um, the scaling dimension of that state has to be greater than or equal to d minus 2 over 2. Um, and then you write down, you do, you do some similar things for the other super for the supercharges, you know, Poincare supercharges, the special supercharges, and you get a bunch of sort of inequalities and constraints, and then you can generate a whole list of multiplets, and this has been done uh, in many, many cases. But this assumes nothing about uh, locality. Um, so, 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 right. So this has been done, as I said, in, in, in involving taking other charges, not just momentum. Um, and uh, in principle, of course, um, it's not the case that um, these charges need to have corresponding northern currents. So one sort of very nice example is this long-range Ising model, where basically instead of the usual textbook nearest neighbor interactions, you allow the the interactions between the spins to decay like some power law. So, so if, if this decay is not fast enough, okay, then um, the theory that you get in the continuum is still conformal, but it's not local. It doesn't have an energy momentum tensor. So, so it has some non-local conformal symmetry. So it has the topological defects corresponding to the conformal group, but it doesn't have the corresponding northern currents. Okay? And more generally, you know, to anyone who's studied generalized free fields, you know that, that similar things happen. And even more generally, you know, if you have QFTs living on defects and boundaries that are coupled to some bulk, uh, some QFT bulk, uh, then uh, you, you also will, will, will typically um, not have a local theory. Um, and you can still do the, the, the Dolan and Osborne uh, stuff, um, but, but you, 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 you miss some physics. You miss the physics uh, coming from locality. So um, for me, imposing locality will mean imposing the existence of an energy momentum tensor, okay? um, and corresponding, obviously, since I'm doing supersymmetry, and corresponding super, supersymmetry multiple. So the energy momentum tensor comes in some family with, with the supercurrents and some other stuff, the R currents. The technical details won't be terribly important. Um, 
uh, but uh, this turns out to imply more uh, than the existence of a multiple. So, so it implies, for example, word identity. So you know, you'll have three point functions that have to obey word identities where you have O, some operator O, T, U, O, dagger, and various other uh, word identities involving other currents in the, in the, in the super, super in, the, in the stress tensor multiplet. And it also implies things like ANEC, which has been used famously to derive all sorts of very cool stuff. Um, where basically you, you consider sort of expectation values of energy momentum tensor in certain states, um, and you, you know you integrate over some some, some light like geodesics, and you have various inequalities. Um, and as it turns out, in principle, and actually factual, not just in principle, but it actually does happen. Um, locality can rule out many many of the unitary um, representations of the superconformal algebra. So this happens in four dimensions, um, and um, and in higher dimensions. Um, we'll see that it's not the case, however, in, in lower dimensions. But it does play a crucial role in four dimensions where this phenomenon is known and rigorously proven, at least at the level of physics, to occur. Um, and so we'll see, though, that the picture in four dimensions is still a little bit more complicated than what's actually known in the literature. But this will lead to some sort of interesting set of conjectures uh, for four dimensions that I hope well, will um, spark at least some attempts to, to try to prove or disprove. Okay, so now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss a little bit how things vary in space-time dimension. Um, and then I'm going to sort of, so I'm going to stay, you know, tell you sort of how things work in different dimensions and then spend the bulk of the talk in four dimensions. So, um, so, so, so how do we expect the physics, uh, the physics to work as a function of space-time dimension? Well, roughly speaking, the lower in dimension you are, um, the, the sort of the richer you expect um, the infrared phases of theories deformed by relevant deformations to be. So, so for example, in two dimensions already, um, say for C equals one, you have this very beautiful um, moduli space that I was just <laughs> drawing on, on Yifan's board, um, where you have like all these very interesting sort of points. And then of course you have all sorts of interesting RG fields from these points. So it's fun to study these uh, Ryan Thorngren, um, and you get all sorts of very interesting RG flows. So, so this is the, the physics in 2D, say starting from a simple Lagrangian um, is much, much richer um, than the physics that you have in higher dimensions. And then generally you expect as you go up higher and higher and higher in dimension, um, Lagrangians get sort of more and more boring. Um, and uh, so, so sticking with uh, stick, sticking with two dimensions, so this is the comment I've already made, um, relevant, relevant deformations take us to this, to this infinitely many zero minimal models. Um, and um, already this, the UV starting point um, is very rich. And in addition, in two dimensions, you can often, through this Coulomb gas formalism, construct not just sort of abstract representations from free field, but also whole operator algebras. Um, and so, sort of what we did. So, so what, what what did we do? So, so the problem that I start that I started with um, applied to two dimensions basically can be solved in the following way. So, so in in, in two dimensions, um, uh, we we studied we we, to, we studied a particular representation of the of a particular superconformal algebra with eight quantum supercharges, namely the the small um, n equals four comma four um, superconformal algebra, and what we showed, and I'm not going to get into the details here. If you want, you can look in the paper. Um, basically, we showed that any representation of, of this of this algebra can be realized by free fields. It's not terribly difficult. Basically, you can take a bunch of sort of T four sigma models and take products over those sigma models, and you can basically build any possible uh, irreducible representation of this algebra. And I think the same thing holds more generally for other superconformal algebras in two dimensions. Do you think that this is true for the large conformal algebra? I think it's also true, but we didn't check very right carefully. Mm -hmm. So I think I think I think it's still true. But the center charge in that case will not be integer. Yeah, but I think but I think it's still true when you're sort of allowed to take sort of continuous deformations. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But to, to do that, you have to specify the continuous deformation. So, so I should say that we haven't looked at that case okay. in detail precisely okay. because of this reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. other questions. Yeah. So similarly, in 3D n equals 4, um, the, so if you study 3D n equals 4, you sort of uh, have lots of power for free fields as well. You, you know that a lot of non-Lagrangian theories, for anyone who studied non-Lagrangian theories in 4D, you know that reducing on a circle to 3D uh, often re results in a Lagrangian theory. So, so, so for example, Arjuna Stuckless theories, they often don't have it. I mean, they don't have n equals 2 Lagrangians in 4D, but in 3D, many of them have n equals 4 Lagrangians. So you get the idea that in 3D, um, you should be able to sort of construct any representation of the 3D n equals 4 superconformal algebra 
um, from, from you know, products of free fields. And again, I'm not going to go through the logic. Um, it's, it's easy to check that basically any short representation of, of this algebra can be realized by free fields. You have to worry about um, long multiplets. So this is kind of a similar point. Like you have to worry about long multiplets. And long multiplets, of course, can take on unprotected dimensions, which, of course, you don't get in the case of free fields. But there you, again, at least if I allow for continuous deformations away from the free point, sort of in analogy with that super Ising model that I discussed at the beginning, then you can cover this whole space. Um, but you can ask, like, okay, so maybe the rules of the game are so loose that you can always do this in any dimension. Um, the answer turns out to be, however, in higher dimensions, th th this doesn't work. So in higher dimensions, um, Lagrangians are pretty crappy. Um, and uh, you, you can just show, for example, so, so that might sort of make you think that, you know, you can't solve this problem in higher dimensions. And indeed, you can check in 5D n equals 1. Um, it's not possible to construct all representations of your free fields or continuous deformations thereof. Um, and you can show there's one particular multiple with some horrible shortening condition that exists in this E2 um, SCFT of cyber. It's not possible as a statement. It's not possible. Yeah. So there, there's a counterexample. No, there's a counterexample. You can take the E2 SCFT of cyber, and you can simply show that there exists a multiple, like using the index, you can show that there exists a multiple of this multiple with this cap E8400040. And you can simply show that if you take free fields, you, you cannot possibly. So we don't really try to continue another Yeah, yeah. Even with even up to continuous deformation, this is not possible. And similar logic holds in six dimensions. So so this leads this leaves the case of four dimensions left over. Um, and um, so four D is kind of in between the two cases where every, basically everything's possible in two and three D, and some things are not are impossible in higher dimensions. So you might wonder if this is sort of the most interesting case. Um, and indeed, yeah. Let me ask yeah. a question. So. By continuous deformation, are you restricted to like turning on relevant operators? Yeah. So there's also a deformation by you know, turning on that, and that does relate to you know the five DS, six DS, CFTs to free theories. Yeah. So so I'm 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 in principle allowing for anything. Uh -huh. like, it could be a relevant deformation. It could be a, it could also be an expectation. But for example, I, I the E two does have a deformation to the free theory by going on to the Coulomb branch. Yeah, that's right. But but this is also a continuous deformation. Yeah, that's that's a continuous deformation. But how it's consistent with this? Uh... You're asking so so yeah. you're saying like for example so what this happens e2... to this a a zero zero four? Excellent question. Yeah. Uh, so so I think what this means is that this this operator decouples when you go to the to the to the Coulomb branch. Mm -hmm. so, so you have a Coulomb branch. This theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have some moduli space, yes. and I think like when you go to the moduli space, yes. I, I believe that this this this, this multiple decouples. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I don't have. A, I, I can just tell you that it's it, it consistent. It's somehow consistent with some some other subset of operators do not consistent in the sense of like operator products. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that so little is known about the operator product in this theory, right? But, I, I assume it's consistent, right? Because this is the protected operator, right? This is a protect, but it's like extremely. It's like the most unprotected protected operator. So something oh, it's like, a threshold operator. It, it, it's it, it, it's something that satisfies a shortening condition involving four supercharges. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of the crappiest shortening condition. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so 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 okay. So I guess there are a couple. Yeah. Uh, let me see what I can say if I can say something slightly more elaborate. Yeah. So 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 my guess is yeah, I don't have a, obviously I don't have like. Proof of what mm -hmm. happens. My guess is that this operator flows to something. Um, so probably flows to zero, essentially. Um, let's see if I can say something more. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't expect, like, so supersymmetry is preserved. Um, so, right, so, I mean, well, right, so, so, so we consider, so I'm considering deformations where supersymmetry is preserved. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess one thing which is possible, one thing which is lo another logical possibility. So the short answer to your question is it's an interesting question. I don't know. I guess another logical possibility might be um, that it satisfies that it becomes even shorter. Right? Like mm -hmm. suppose it flows to something which satisfies mm -hmm. even more, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. stringent shortening conditions. That's possible, right? Mm -hmm. So, 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 so it, could, it could flow to zero, or maybe it flows to something okay. which satisfies more shortening conditions that can't be realized in the fields. Um, I guess those are two sort of logical possibilities, and I don't know which, which you can actually realize. Uh, yeah, does that make sense? 
Yeah. Do you have a does this example persist in like large n theories? Like a large n version of the two model? Yeah, so I was discussing this with Hitchell Kim and I mean this, so, so, so the way that I got it, the way to understand it, we're going to ask you if there's a way to understand this operator is also from gravity. Yeah, that's a good question. So, of course, as you can see, this is a small n theory, basically. Yeah, yeah but theory. there's a, there's a yeah. higher rank version of it. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, as far as I, so, so I didn't look at this systematically, but sort of of the five, like this, as you can imagine, somehow depends on looking at the super conformal index where things have been solved and looking yeah. sort of at low order in the fugacity yeah. expansion. Yeah. Um, and it's just a fact that um, for, for, for at least many of the theories where most of all the other theories, it, at least it's, it's absent or, or, or it might be canceled essentially mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in you know, all the theories that these guys have in this study. So, so, so my guess is that it's not so easy to see. It just, it just so happens that in E2, you have just the right somehow set of conditions to appear uh, for, this to, for, for, for this operator to sort of its presence to be just detectable from the index, if that makes sense. It's a very weird operator because it satisfies like this operator. I mean, sorry, a lot of weird things happen in this particular theory. So like, a lot, like a lot of weird phenomena. So I don't know if this is something to do just with the E two theory itself. Like the E two theory also has something else weird that happens that, that is very unusual, which is that um, you know this this thing I think has a U one symmetry. U one has a U two. Sorry. So so this has a U one. It has U one flavor symmetry. In addition, U two has bigger symmetry. Yeah, but it, it, it sorry. So maybe I should, it has at least the it, ha, it has, for example, it has a U one flavor something. Right. Yeah, but big, bigger, indeed bigger than that. Yeah. Um, but so so there is at least there's one moment map, one yeah. one U one moment map, I believe, which is no put in the mm -hmm. sense that it squares, it essentially squares to zero. So 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 which is unusual, right? Because usually you have, I mean, that means that it can't take on an expectation value. Mm -hmm. So you have some moment map mm -hmm. which can't take on an expectation mm -hmm. value, which is unusual. Right? I don't know of any other examples where this happens. That doesn't happen in free theories either. So a lot of weird stuff happens. Like you have nilpotent moment maps, but usually that involves some contraction of indices where they can still take expectation values. Here, there's a moment map which simply can't take expectation values. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so there's lots of fun, weird stuff going on. Yeah, so, so let me just make sure the kind of the big picture. So you're not saying this phenomenon is generic, even in five or six dimensions. You're saying there are examples. Yeah, I'm saying there are examples, right? I mean, because to sort of find this phenomenon in five or six dimensions, you have to look at the index. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. Okay. Um, it's, it's just very lucky somehow that the E2 yeah. has these pathologies happening. That's yeah, and I don't understand the, the deep reason for it. It'd be very interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's not the case that in two dimensions, we can also think of a very weird case. At least not, <laughs> I can say rigorously, with the, if you have yeah, a small yeah. four comma four algebra, no. But, but uh, just, it's a theorem, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a deep theorem. Other question. Okay, so um, so so uh, right. So 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 forty is, is is also kind of weird. I mean, not weird, but it's special maybe um, from the point of view of theories of eight bonfire supercharges because it also has a U one R symmetry. Uh, it has an abelian R, R symmetry factor in addition to the non abelian one, um, and um, this turns out to make it much more subtle. This is also one of the reasons it's much more interesting than, than, than the other examples. Supercharges, um, and our central conjecture, and we came up with lots of non-trivial evidence for this fact, uh, is that it's always possible to construct arbitrary multiplets of this algebra, the 40n equals two superconformal algebra, um, at least local. In the case of local theories, um, from continuous deformations of representations. Actually, this should say local. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, crucially, these have to be compatible with locality. So, so basically, any any representation of 40n equals two super conformal algebra that's compatible with locality um, will will be our conjecture is possible to construct um, from continuous deformations of representations in fields. Um, we'll see examples. There are examples where it's just it's not possible to in, in, in our local theories. So, um, what did we do? We proved some aspects of this conjecture, um, and we also found a web of supporting evidence and uh, mutually consistent conjectures more generally that at least to me are interesting um, and, and perhaps point to, to some larger structure that might be worth trying to unravel. So, um, so, so, so this conjecture interfaces with some intuition that I'll explain from studying 40 n equals 2 theories. Um, and what it turns out to do is to rule out many superconformal algebra representations, local unitary theories, and also Interestingly, it turns out to constrain um, the way allowed representations transform under flavor symmetries. And if you're also a fan 
of this Rustelli beam vertex operator algebra for n equals two story, um, it turns out to lead to some cute uh, consequences for some sort of associated vertex algebra. So, um, so, 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 so let me just um, say that, so to give you some, some idea of what's going on in 4D, I mean, I, I assume probably most people are not uh, experts in all the details of the 4D equals 2 super conformal algebra, so this will look like some alphabet soup. So let me try to motivate, roughly speaking, this alphabet soup. I mean, don't pay much attention to these letters. Basically, there are two types of representations, broadly speaking, that you could imagine in 4D equals 2, ones that contain chiral operators and ones that do not. Okay, where for me, chiral operator will be something that's chiral with respect to the smallest uh, uh, super, super conformal algebra. Um, in other words, chiral with respect to some n equals one sub algebra. That equals two. So it turns out that there are these this soup of operators in equation 10, which, are, uh, which contain chiral operators. So just to give you an idea, this is something, these are operators that appear in cyber Witten theory. These are the things, the E-bar operators. These are things that appear in the sort of solution parameterizing the expectation values like the coordinates on this on this moduli space are sort of sort of given by, by these E-bar operators. So these are crucial basically in cyber witten theory. Uh, the B hat operators are Higgs branch uh, uh, operators. So they are things that parameterize um, uh, roughly speaking moduli spaces where you have just free hypermultiples of the thread. Um, and then there are a bunch of other sort of more exotic representations that have, contain extra supersymmetry currents and various other sort of stuff that Hear about. Then um, in, in equation 11, there are the operators that do not contain chiral operators. So famously, these include the C hat operators. These are things like the energy momentum tensor uh, and its friends, uh, and then also some, some more exotic uh, operators, the C bar operators. Okay, so roughly speaking, you have chiral and non chiral uh, representations. So let me give you some intuition for why um, this conjecture might be true. So, uh, so, so l l let me first discuss the case of chiral operators. And again, this is not Bourbaki proof. This is just some, some, a little bit of intuition. So you, so you may or may not like it. But in the case of chiral operators, um, it, it's sort of not unreasonable to think that chiral operators should be captured roughly by looking at three chiral fields and maybe truncating, you know, imposing shortening conditions. I'm oh, sorry, imposing, imposing recombination, um, like Gabriel asked. Uh, you know, as in three n equals two case, um, and the reason is roughly that uh, chiral operators, well, they have a, they satisfy a nice chiral ring. Of course, they have a more complicated OPE, but at least the chiral ring is is very nice. Scaling dimensions add, um, and basically um, up to null relations that don't follow from statistics. Um, these, 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 you know, this this operator structure, this ring structure, essentially maps from free fields to interactive series. So up to essentially having to truncate the chiral ring or do something like that. Um, this structure maps from free fields to interacting theories. Um, and okay, if you have to, if, if in the interacting theories all you do is toss out more, more stuff, then that's okay for the point of view of this um, So it's reasonable to imagine at least that all chiral representations of the superconformal algebra can be realized um, by, by free fields. Um, and uh, in the case of non chiral multiples, the intuition is slightly different. Um, so, so, so for first, um, from locality, um, we have a stress tensor multiplet. So this happens to be a particular guy, C hat. Um, more generally, um, in the case of free theories, um, we have uh, an infinite set of higher spin currents. So these have been described by Mala Sen and Jiboydev and various other people. So what are these higher spin currents? They're essentially currents of arbitrary spin that are bilinears in free fields that have increasingly many derivatives. Okay? And the existence of these currents leads to uh, a lot of constraints and well, leads to integrability of free theories. Um, and, and, and if you analyze um, these representations, again, this equation 15 might not be much, but you can sort of take all possible free multiples, all, all possible higher spin multiples, and then sort of compute, like, where do these, where can these sit in representation theory? And they turn out somehow not to exhaust all the possible um, representations that, that could have, not all the possible representations that could have appeared through up here. So you can just list them um, in equation 15. What's so this, K yeah. What's K there? Sorry. Why can you just explain what is K? Good. Yeah, so probably I should have explained a lot a lot of this stuff more. But I, so so C hat, right? So C hat this this first of all, this first zero is the R charge of the prime of the SU2R weight of the primary. So it's 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 a scalar under SU2R. And then these are spins, yeah. essentially. So you get you know arbitrarily high spin for the primary, right? Because the current, which is some descendant, is arbitrarily high spin. 
Oh yeah, sorry. I think it's just this yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. The, the, what, one point which is crucial, which is a technical point, which if, 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 you, if you're not following this and you don't give a shit, then don't, don't listen to this point, but, but a technical point is that not all possible things, not all possible C hat zero J comma K multiplets actually appear. So, so you can, since, since they should involve free fields, maybe, or discrete gagings of free fields. Is, is, is there a yeah. reason? Because typically what, what this phenomena happens is because you have some automorphism that gives some particular set of representations uh, is there a kind of reason why it doesn't? Why, why, why not all, the, not, why not all yeah, possible JNK? Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, I should develop an intuition for why that is. This is simply, I'm going to present it. Because sometimes there are some yeah. extra hard space in Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then they interchange those. Yeah, no, they... well, so, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe, so, so, so you have some, sorry, maybe you can explain more. Scene, yeah, yeah. So, so you have some, like, automorphic, you have some algebra? Yeah, higher so I'm trying to some, some, inter some symmetry between representations that uh -huh. interchange them. Okay, this is interesting. I mean, I had at some point some idea to try to study exactly this question. So maybe, I don't know. Maybe I can. I don't have anything to tell you. Um, but yeah, maybe you can tell me more. Uh, so, 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 so this is the, the way I've derived this essentially is just to say, okay. I mean, we have free higher spin. We, we have a free theory, right? Basically, or something which is like a free theory, which I'm taking to be basically a discrete gauging, something like a discrete gauging of let's say a free theory. Right? You can imagine that you have free fields, but you could also imagine, say, throwing in. Um, you can imagine also discretely gauging some of the symmetries, right? So you project out some of them. So, so, so that would be like a free theory. I mean, that's also a free theory. And basically, in, 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 in these kinds of theories, this, basically, this is all you can realize. Like in, in these sort of locally realized free theories, this is all you find. Um, yeah, I don't, there, there should be some beautiful algebraic reason for this. Like, that's a good question. Like, they have some uh, other questions? Okay, so 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 more generally, um, uh, right? So so more generally, we have uh, not just right. So 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 these representations have you know, as Gabriel was asking, you know, he was asking, what does this stuff mean? So more generally, of course, you also have representations with higher SU two R weight. Um, but the, the 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 and again, this is extremely heuristic. Um, so the, the the basic idea is that somehow you know, if the spin J plus J bar is much much bigger than the SU two R weight, right? There are all these sort of examples where um, the, the CFT spectrum sort of takes on properties of, of, of a free theory. And so what you expect is that in this large spin limit, roughly speaking, you could sort of forget um, this R and essentially find some kind of at least effective higher spin symmetry. This is roughly, roughly, roughly one idea. Um, and also, at least for sufficiently small spin, um, it turns out you can construct any multiple from free fields. So, and, and this latter fact just follows from some basic facts that hypermultiplets are, are fundamentals of SU2R and vector multiplets are only charged under U1R. So sort of in these two regimes, you can kind of um, sort of squint your eyes and imagine that you can construct everything from three fields. And then if you at least grant me to sort of be a little bit um, loose with what happens in between, then you at least might believe that, 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 that there should be some reason um, why, why, why this works. I'll give some more, some much more evidence, but roughly speaking, this is some sort of naive intuition uh, for, 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 for for what happens. So, um, so, so, so let, let, let me now look at some of these representations, um, and 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 let's see how locality enters. So, first, you can consider these sort of um, Higgs branch uh, operators, these B hat R multiplets. And for the people who are experts, you know that there are all sorts of non-normalization theorems relating to the Higgs branch. Um, so it might seem quite natural to you that you should be able to build any Higgs branch operator from free fields because ultimately, you know, you flow, let's say, to some, to some free theory on the Higgs branch. There are these, all these kinds of uh, non-normalization theorems, and so you might imagine that, that anything that you can build, that all the Higgs branch operators can indeed be built from free fields. And this is just, of course, a mathematical fact. So these operators are labeled just by some SU2R weight. They're scalars labeled by some SU2R weight. And basically the trivial fact is that since the free hypermultiplet is the fundamental representation of SU2R, obviously you can build any possible representation of, of the Higgs branch from products of, of hypermultiplets. So nothing deep. Um, uh, and an interesting fact is that these multiplets are also related to states in the 2D BOA of, of Rastelli and Bean. And I'll come back in a, in a few slides to why, to why this fact is So the, the next thing to consider are these um, sort of cyborg witten type operators, these E-bar multiplets. So these have some U1R charge, little r, 
They're uncharged under SU2R, so they parameterize at least for zero spin when j equals zero. They parameterize this moduli space that Cyber can put in this study. Um, uh, more generally, you could imagine, however, that they have some spin. Superconformal algebra allows you to attach some non-trivial left spin to these operators. Um, but uh, uh, so, so, so they satisfy this particular shortening condition. They're annihilated by all the empty chiral supersymmetries. But in a free theory, you can just check again that the only type of operators of this type that you can construct are, single, are, 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 are scalars uh, under Lorentz, because basically anything with spin will become essentially a, 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 a super descendant. But more interestingly, um, there are some deeper reasons why, why these multiples are absent in locality in, in, in local theories, because you can study the three-point function of E bar R, C hat, and E. Um, and you can, you can see that basically superconformal word identities are satisfied if and only if J is equal to zero. So these additional multiples that are in principle allowed by the topological defects in the superconformal algebra are, are, are sort of absent when you, when you, when you impose locality. So this is precisely also what happens in the case of free fields. Right? So this is some kind of check, let's say, of this, of this idea. Right? You have free fields. In the case of free fields, you can only get scalar E bar operators. And then there's also, it turns out to be a deeper reason why this is true. Next, we can also consider some slightly more exotic multiplets. So these are multiplets. These D bar R, J comma zero multiplets contain things like extra supersymmetry currents and also more general uh, multiplets. They're, they also turn out to be sort of interesting in the, in the world of 2D DOAs. Um, uh, and you can again check, like uh, in free theories, you can check that they should have spin less than or equal to R. So this, so you're not allowed to have basically arbitrarily high, high uh, J for, for this representation. So, so for example, in the case R equals zero, um, this would, this is basically not allowed by the Weinberg-Witten theorem um, because you know, you, you'd have some higher spin fields, essentially three higher spin fields, if, and, and this would be compatible with, with a good energy momentum tensor. But more generally, it turns out that you can use the ANEC to prove, uh, well, you, you, you can see them in free theories. Um, you have to have spin less than or equal to R, and you can also then use the ANEC to basically show that that's true in interacting with these that are at least local. And then we can also consider some uh, the remaining chiral multiplets. So these are the somewhat more exotic B bar multiplets. Um, I mean, for people who are not connoisseurs of 40n equals 2 supersymmetry, Probably you won't care at all about the b-bar multiplets. They're basically the most exotic chiral operators that you can have in a 40n equals 2 theory. They come from mixed branches, from higher rank Coulomb branches, and they also exist, for example, when you have this um, Witten's SU2 anomaly. Um, so so uh, in free theories, again, for these additional representations, you can check that the spin has to be bounded by the SU2R weight. Um, and again, you can extend the analysis of Monenti, Sterjo, and Vicky, their an an ANIC analysis, and at least show that for a certain range of UNR charges, again, they must, the ANIC implies this constraint. And we've been working uh, embarrassingly slowly on, uh, on sort of upgrading this uh, to a full proof for, for, for all of UNR charges. I, I believe it's true, but well, this is getting much longer than I had hoped. Um, but uh, uh, so, 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 so at least it looks pretty, Pretty solid to believe that the b-bar multiplets again should obey this kind of bound, um, which is precisely the bound, like this bound on spin versus R charge, that is again present in, in free theories. But even more generally, in all the examples that have been constructed so far, at least that I'm aware of, these b-bar multiplets essentially come from these special kind of chiral OPEs, where basically you have chiral multiplets that already satisfy the bounds. So the d-hat multiplets are sort of required by the OPE therefore. The B bar multiplets are, that appear in these OPEs are also required to satisfy these bounds. The other way that, they, that these B bars seem to occur in real examples is through gauging, where you basically gauge some symmetry under which B hat and D bar multiplets are charged. And again, basically using the rigorous bounds on B hat and D bar multiplets, um, you, can, you can see that all B bar multiplets of this type um, satisfy the bounds as well. Okay. So finally, we can also consider non chiral, these non chiral C hat R multiplets. And it turns out that like the B hat and D bar multiplets, they form part of what's called the shore sector of operators uh, in, in, in 4D n equals 2 theory. So the, the shore sector are some operators that are related to 2D DOAs through some sort of twisting procedure on a plane inside four dimensions. And um, uh, the, the, these multiplets sort of interface in some interesting way. Um, so for example, the, the stress tensor, the C hat 0, 0, comma, 0 multiplets so that are J and J bar are zero. These give you the stress tensor multiple, which becomes the stress tensor of the 2D DOA. And there are various generalizations. 
Um, the, the, this, this, the, these multiplets um, turn out to have some, some, some very interesting um, behavior out of this conjecture. So, um, so, so you can ask, like, uh, what kind of bounds do the C-hat multiplets satisfy? And one thing you can work out is basically the most general possible bound that's compatible with CPT and linearity is essentially this, this bound that I've written in equation 24, um, where AR, A plus, A, so A little r, A plus, A big r, and A are some constants. Locality implies that A has to be negative because basically um, any, the, the stress tensor multiplet has zero UNR, zero J, zero J bar, zero R. So the stress tensor multiplet existing means that A has to be less than or equal to zero. And then finally, the spectrum of possible higher spin multiplets, um, the, the fact that, that it takes this, the, the form that I described uh, previously in a local theory, essentially uh, guarantees that this A plus, this constant A plus also has to be zero. And finally, um, the existence of some sort of simple C hat R zero comma zero multiplets that you can get by taking say the product of free fields comprising some B hat R multiplet and free fields comprising a stress tensor multiplet tell you that A big R has to be less than or equal to zero. And then to get a constraint, you can, without loss of generality, A R has to be positive and you can take it by sort of renormalizing these coefficients to be one. Um, and then combined with the fact that C hat R this is a representation theory fact that the C hat multiplet, the C hat representation with negative spin turns out to be a D bar representation. You can show basically that this, this equation 24 implies this bound in equation 26 for C hat multiplets. Sorry, the, the reason you assume linearity is because the kind of bound, this kind of uh, constraint you get is from the open uh, linear three bound function? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm having in mind. Okay. Yeah, you could, you could object and say maybe I should consider something more general, but that's, that's what I'm But yeah, this is at least, uh, I mean, this is necessary, but it could be stronger than that. Indeed. So, so and, and the nice thing is that this bound that we've sort of reasoned at from some sort of general consideration turns out to be the bound that's satisfied by free fields. And again, it's possible that there have been now a bunch of conjectures about 40 2D systems, like 40 n equals 2 theories and 2D VOAs, and this turns out to interact nicely with some of those conjectures of you and Rostellian friends. So for example, um, they conjecture that every time you have a theory with, a, with an actual Higgs branch, so a branch where you actually have free hypermultiplets at points, on the Higgs branch, um, that the B hat R multiplets uh, weakly generate the 2D BOA. So in other words, generate it through their OPEs, including singular terms. Um, and uh, you can check uh, that, 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 that this conjecture is completely compatible um, with, 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 with the bounds that, 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 that I mentioned. The C hat multiplets. This just follows from looking at OPEs, what can appear singularly in the OPEs of these multiplets. Also, um, it's easy to check compatibility of this conjecture. With class S theories um, that, that are sort of vanilla, the ones that come from not doing anything fancy with the punctures, I mean, just regular punctures and gauging. So basically, taking like simple Trinion theories like the uh, like Yoto theory. Yeah, but like, by now things have gotten very complicated. So now you have these punctures that are not automorphism twists, all sorts of stuff. You know, and like just the, if you take just the regular punctures that like Yoto like, talked about in his first paper. Uh, so for an example would be an T3 theory like this Mahan Nemashansky who relies in terms of three punk three punctured sphere. If you take vanilla theories. It's like to put three neons with tubes. Yeah, yeah. If you take those and you put and you basically glue them together with tubes, essentially the bound also works out, basically. Um, and that, that follows from the fact that you know when the gluing procedure with tubes algebraically just corresponds to this equation The tubes are given by these little phi's. OIs are operators sort of supported up. Which by the way, this is this opens a lot to a totally different relation with two EP or two or something like that. That, that. Yeah, that's also interesting. Yeah, in principle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to say, yeah, but but, but indeed, yeah, I mean there should be something to it. Yeah, so, so, so some relation to Okay, so so yeah, um, yeah, in the last few minutes. Uh, right, so what else do I want to say? Uh, right, so um, yeah, so, 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 so one more thing to say, I mean, I'm just saying this for completeness, these C bar multiplets, so these are like the, 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 the least protected short multiplets, so they're the analogs of these A bar or whatever A multiplets we were discussing earlier, 5D. These multiplets are the least protected 40 n equals 2 multiplets, and then we have this conjecture based on what I've said before, with some, again, some kind of similar supporting evidence that, that unitarity and locality implies this bound here. Okay, um, so, so now in the last few minutes, I want to sort of describe now what, what this might mean. Okay, like, so besides the fact that, that this 
probably kills a lot of the representations in, in, in Dolan and Osborne and all these other places. Um, like, so, so, so what? Like, like, what else can you say that, that would be interesting? Um, and so, so, so one thing that it means, it turns out, is that there are additional. So if you believe these conjectures, and there's, you can decide whether you believe them or not. But if you believe them, um, then uh, then it turns out that there's a new sort of well-defined limit of the superconformal index in four dimensions. So this new limit of the superconformal index um, is the following. So this is the superconformal index. It's some, you know, some trace over the Hilbert space of local operators weighted by this minus one to the F, this fermion number. Um, and then it has some fugacities. It's Q, U, and T. These are some complex numbers uh, that sort of count operators by superconformal quantum numbers. So they count operators by left spin J, right spin J bar, and also by SU to R weight R and U on R charge. And there are various limits of this index that you can try to compute. Famous ones include the Shore limit, which is related to VOA characters, the Donald limit, the Coulomb branch limit, various, these, and the Hall-Littlewood limit. So for the experts, these are basically the special limits. So if you believe these conjectures, then there should be a general <laughs> new limit, which you can get by essentially taking this T fugacity and setting it to zero. Okay? This follows essentially from the bounds that I described. If those bounds are violated, then you get some divergences. Okay, so they're, they're, if they're respected, then setting t to zero won't blow anything up, and this, this, this new limit will be well defined. So you take t goes to zero with q and u fixed, and you can ask, well, what does, what does this tell you about four dimensional physics? So basically, the only operators that will contribute, of course, will be operators where r plus j bar minus j is zero, so this becomes a constant. Right? When you take q to zero. So, uh, Gade, Rastelli, and Razmat in their paper on indices took a look at this in free theories. So, so, so they wrote it down because in free theories, obviously, you can do this. We claim that it's something more generally true. And if you take this in the case of, say, free vector theory um, with some number of hypers, um, basically the hypers don't contribute in any way. You can check when you set t to zero. The only contributions you get are essentially from, uh, from, from you know, Coulomb branch, from, from, from scalars, the vector multiple, and from fermions multiplet, and you get some contribution from derivatives. So this is a little bit more general than the usual Coulomb branch limit. And again, Rastelli, Razamat, and Gade checked that in a Lagrangian theory, so they were considering the t goes to zero limit only because uh, they, 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 well, they were being careful and were saying essentially that well, this is something well-defined in a free theory, but might not, or, or in a Lagrangian theory, but not, might not be well-defined more generally. Um, and so, you know, they computed what happens in a general uh, Lagrangian gauge theory, where you have a bunch of, you know, generators of, SU, of U on R charge R. So, for example, if you have SU three gauge theory, you have things like I don't know trace phi squared, you know, you have trace phi squared, you have things like trace phi cubed. So these are this is something with R equals two, something with R equals three, and you know you get a product over these generators. So you get some contribution. Um, basically, this this product in, in U gives you the contributions. From these, from these generators that, that give you the cyber wooden geometry. And then you also have some additional contributions from fermionic descendants and derivatives. Yeah. So, um, so we conjecture that this limit is well-defined more generally, and we did some checks. Uh, we checked theories that don't have n equals two Lagrangians. So we checked theories that, that, that yeah, that, that, like Archer's Douglas theories that sort of lack these n equals two Lagrangians, and they all have some very nice form that's exactly the same, basically. Where now you get the product of statistic exponentials, where essentially the, the generators of this index are essentially the E bar multiplets, the, the cyber width multiplets, now with some fractional dimensions. So the Argyros Douglas theories don't have these nice integer dimension uh, Casimirs, instead, they have fractional dimensional operators. Um, and we check that the index in these cases uh, still corresponds to something which looks like essentially a product over generators of the Coulomb branch, now with some more general U on R charge. And again, involving basically the cyber witten operators and then some descendants, some fermionic descendants. And um, so what we, what we conjecture is that this is true more generally uh, in 4 n equals 2 superconformal field theories for all the reasons uh, that I mentioned earlier in the talk, plus the fact, you know, the non-trivial fact that non-Lagrangian theories also turn out to have this nice form where basically you're taking a product essentially, the plethistic exponential is basically taking a product of all possible you know, E bar multiplets possible product of the E-bar multiples and derivatives thereof. Um, and um, since, these, so, 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 so since these indices are generated by E-bar multiples, um, it means a few things. One, one thing it means is that this limit, this sort of generalized Coulomb branch limit, is independent of flavor. And the reason is that the E-bar multiples 
are, you can just show from OPE considerations, general OPE considerations, the EBAR multiplets are independent of flavor. This falls from the fact that they're SU2R neutral, so you can just use OPE arguments to argue that the generators of this index must be neutral under flavor. This is a non perturbative fact in 40n equals 2. So that means that this derivative of this, this, this index with respect to the flavor fugacity is zero. So in other words, it's completely independent of the flavor, of the flavor symmetry. And that means that basically any, op so, so, so that leads us to conjecture that basically any operator that can appear in this plethistic exponential is also neutral under flavor symmetry. Of course, in the index, sometimes you can have cases where operator contributions cancel. But here, essentially, in order to believe that all the, in order to believe that this does not imply that the operators contributing to this index are flavor neutral, you have to believe that basically every single possible combination with not involving flavor somehow cancels, which is an enormous conspiracy. And that's a conspiracy that's much stronger than the cancellation of operators in the usual index. So we conjecture that doesn't happen. And what does that mean? That means basically that all the representations that I've written in equation 33 are neutral under any flavor symmetry in any sort of local unitary 40n equals 2 sort of false field theory, at least the freely generated form branch. Um, and um, let me say one more thing. So let me make some connection now with Maldasen and Jaboidev. It, since the, it, it, since we, we conjecture basically that this limit uh, is well defined. So you can also imagine taking now, since we have this limit being well defined, you can also imagine taking u goes to zero. And this turns out to give you uh, what we call a reduced McDonald limit. So so this, this is a limit. Um, so, so basically, to get something useful in this limit, as you can see, basically, this little r has to be 1. In other words, you have to hit the unitarity bound for the e-bar multiple. So in other words, you have to be exactly in a free theory in order to have this index in the u goes to 0 limit give you something non-trivial. So again, what, what we conjecture this means is that in this free McDonald limit, um, you only have non-trivial contributions to the index when you have a free theory. So in particular, what does that mean? Ah, because uh, basically this pre facto uh, yeah. minus q to a, u to a power, the power has to exceed otherwise. Uh, exactly, yeah. So, so this exactly has to hit the and free unitary bound. Like one of the free theory. Yeah, yeah. otherwise this index is one. Yeah. Of course, you could again take the person, you could again, I mean, you could again, I, I've tried actually uh, with, with a bunch of people to try to prove like that, you know, these things can't happen at least in the limit where you have derivatives contributing to the index that it's impossible to have complete cancellation in the index. I've never managed to give a complete proof of this fact, but I believe it's, to be, it's true. So you'd have, like, if you don't believe what I'm saying, you'd have to sort of say that um, you have an index which cancellation, is, yeah. yeah, like there's a complete cancellation, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, com a total cancellation. I, mean, I have to remain open to that possibility, but somehow but I doubt it. So it would be very strange. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 for, so, so, so unless you believe that, it means that basically these multiplets, c hat j, minus j bar minus one and d, d bar j, j, that this infinite set of multiplets for all j exist only in free theories and in fact only in free vector theories. So this is like some generalization of Maldasen and Jaboidev because basically what Maldasen and Jaboidev said is that you know when j equals j bar plus one, I mean they didn't care about supersymmetry, but if you take Maldasen and Jaboidev and you apply it to supersymmetry, what they basically say is that if j equals j bar plus one, then you know these are things, these, these c hat zero j bar plus one comma j bar multiplets are present and, and similarly for the d bar multiplets, these are present only in the case of free theories. Here what we're saying is that this infinite sort of generalization of, of these multi-descended devoid of multiplets are present only in the existence, only when there exist free theories. And in fact, theories of free vectors. And when you have a free vector, one, one more one thing which is amusing. Um, so, so there's been a lot of work on associated 2D BOAs and giving free field constructions of associated BOAs. In this case here, what our conjecture is saying is that there's an associated vertex algebra that is always freely, freely constructed, constructed from free fields. What does that mean? It means that um, if we have a free theory, right, it, when we have a free theory, essentially th this is the only case in which this index can be non-trivial. And when we have a free theory, the only things that contribute to the limit, to the index and the limit where u goes to zero, are essentially lambda and, and, and the derivative, like the holomorphic gain genome and the derivative. The phi doesn't contribute anymore because its contribution is proportional to u. And since you have just a holomorphic gain genome, basically you can't construct an energy momentum tensor. So in the usual Rastelli beam story, you have a gain genome and an anti, like a, a, a lambda and a lambda bar left and right moving gain genomes, which you can sort of combine into a stress tensor. Here you can't get a stress tensor, so you get a vertex algebra. So you have some kind of algebra with derivatives um, and, and but, but, but no energy momentum tensor. And our conjecture is that this vertex algebra 
which we call sort of the square root VOA vertex algebra, um, exists if and only if the theory is free. I mean, if and only if the theory has free vectors. And so it can sort of be realized, uh, sort of a, 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 an, an invariant, if you like, of, of, of free theories. Yeah. So good. So I think this is exactly an hour. Uh, so yeah, so these are the conclusions. So um, we used representation theory to learn some things about uh, theories with eight Poincaré supercharges. Um, it would be interesting to connect our results further um, with the topology of the space of quantum field theories, maybe with some more categorical constructions. So Shlomo Razamat has some interesting paper where they sort of take seriously the idea of you know, treating the space of quantum field theories and how categorically, where uh, I think you have sort of Object. I, I don't want to say it wrong, but let me just say something that's maybe wrong. You should look at the paper. I think you know, quantum field theories are some kind of objects, maybe in some category, and then maybe our G flows are some morphisms or something like that. Um, so it would be interesting to to, to interface with, with, with that with that discussion. Um, so so another question is like when when particular irreps can't be realized by free fields, um, but correspond to deformation of an era realized by free fields, is it possible to find some closest free field representation? Um, is there some way to interpret this, uh, all, all this business in terms of interfaces or RG interfaces or more general conformal interfaces? Um, finally, um, spin plays an important role in these bounds. You saw that with the E-bar, the E-bar case, for example. So one, one question might be, what if rotational invariance is relaxed? I don't know if people study these kinds of um, and one could ask, you know, if we can say something interesting um, for, for such theories. So that, yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. What do you can you comment more? What do you mean by interpretation in terms of RG interface? Yeah, I mean, this is something that yeah I've been meaning to get to, but somehow other things have kind of gotten in the way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if there's like some some nice way to sort of rephrase everything, um, like just in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, you know, so 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 so, uh, like you, you know, the story with RG interfaces where you basically have some theory, you you deform on half the space, yeah, yeah. let's say, by some relevant deformation, mm -hmm. um, and then you get some basically some kind of interface between yeah. the UVN and IR theory. Um, I don't have anything deep to say except that I'm imagining that maybe, like knowing something about that that interface, like then then you know you, you you could treat somehow the representation theory question that I've just asked in like somehow a more precise way if that makes sense. Like because you'll have on both sides you'll have let's say some super conformal field theory, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm imagining that if you understand this RG interface enough, like maybe you can really prove some theorems. Or some constraints on what is allowed. On yeah, the side. yeah, yeah. Maybe at the level of some kind of mathematical theorems or something. But, but yeah, I mean, I don't have like a precise uh, uh, statement. Sounds like the related to the almost point of view. Yeah. So if you, if you uh, lift some of the supersymmetry to any of the constraints you 